This episode is brought to you by the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook, the first beautifully designed, fully customizable paper charting workbook designed with you in mind. With three years worth of charting pages, the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook has you covered. If you've been looking for a solid alternative to charting apps, you'll love this charting workbook. The Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook is available in both Fahrenheit and Celsius editions, and it's available in spiral bound, paperback, and ebook versions. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash workbook to order your copy today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash workbook. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 431. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I teach women's health professionals how to utilize the menstrual cycle as a vital sign in their practices, and I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with me today. Today, I'm sharing a brand new podcast episode with Laura Owen. If you are not familiar with Laura's work, I have interviewed her on the podcast before. Back in episode 173, we talked about her book, Her Blood is Gold, and the topic of reclaiming menstruation and the wisdom and power of your menstrual cycle. In today's episode, we're talking about menstruation again, and it is really just a fascinating conversation around the different aspects of menstruation and how it has been stigmatized, and also some of the progress that has been made in recent years. For anyone who is in my age range, So I was a high school student in the late 90s. From that perspective, 20 years of kind of observing the landscape with regards to menstruation, there are a lot of changes. I mean, I feel like we can talk about it more openly. There's a lot more conversations happening about endometriosis and the pain women experience. And I think women are starting to step up and demand better and really push for the treatment that they need or for the time off that they need to deal with their periods. And I feel like we're moving away from the whole concept of suffering in silence. And so many of these themes come out in today's conversation. We also talked a little bit about apps and just that whole concept of apps collecting your data. And, you know, is it a good thing? Is it not a good thing? I mean, lots of great research is coming out of it, but do women really know that these apps are taking their information, you know? So there's so many great topics that we discussed today. And before we jump into today's episode, I will just share a little bit about Laura. Dr. Laura Owen is an author, academic, and consultant focused on the ideas and practices that surround menstruation. She holds a PhD on menstrual organization from Monash Business School in Australia and has been a research fellow on menstrual stigma and sustainability at the University of St. Andrews in the UK. Laura's best-selling book, Her Blood is Gold, investigated the influence of culture on menstrual experience and explored ways to honor the menstrual cycle. And her next book, to be published by Oxford University Press, analyzes the impact of new methods of organizing menstruation on individuals and society. And she recently launched a year-long master's level course in contemporary menstrual studies. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode with Laura. And I'm really excited to be here once again with Laura Owen. And today we're going to be talking about menstruation. 
So I, of course, love that topic and especially love talking about that topic with you. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Lisa. It's great to be here. Well, thank you for coming back. And I, I guess I just always like to kind of share that we did meet in person many years ago. It's actually kind of, it's crazy how fast time flies. I don't know how many years ago it was now. Four and a half, I think. Yeah. It was 2017, August 2017, okay. Vancouver Island. Yeah. So four and a half years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, that, so that was the first time we had met and I'm not sure if I had, if I was familiar with your work before that time. And I remember, I think I bought your book from you, your blood is gold or her blood blood is is gold. gold. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And you did this incredible presentation. I don't remember if it was one or several around menstruation. And it was just such a, I guess, a refreshing way to talk about it. And so I think that might be just a great place to start. There's so many different ways that people can talk about menstruation, whether we're talking about the lived experience and the physicality of it, whether we're talking about potential spiritual meanings of it and all of those things, or whether we're talking about the commodification of menstruation and how companies are making money, (laughs) um, creating different products around it. So maybe just share, maybe a good place to start would be what brought you into this particular field at an academic level to be specializing and researching in the area of menstruation? What brought me into menstruation? Oh, goodness. Well, I was interested in it from a really young age. I found my periods very mysterious when I was a teenager. They would sometimes be heavy, sometimes light. Nobody seemed to be able to explain it. I used to get a lot of pain and people used to say, oh, you'll grow out of it when you had your first child. But when you're 15 or 16, that seems a long way off. So it wasn't very helpful, even if it was true or not. And then I went on the pill and uh, I got anxious and depressed on the pill. And I took myself off it just in case, just to see what happened. And about two weeks after I came off it, I had this thought that I felt like myself again. And I thought, huh, that's really interesting. What does that mean to feel like myself? And how did being on the pill stop that? So I just started really sort of listening to my body and following it. And I remember I had, um, I started making charts to chart my cycle and I had no idea how to do that. I didn't know if there were any systems. I mean, this was in the seventies. And uh, so I I would just make up these charts with the day and how I felt and what day of my cycle it was and just trying to figure it out. So it started really young. And then in my 20s, I was um, I studied traditional Chinese medicine. I was an acupuncturist. That was my first career. And menstruation is conceptualized very differently in traditional Asian medicine, as you know. So it's seen more as you know as as part of a cycle and at that part of the cycle you should rest rather than try and push through through it so I started doing that and my symptoms got a lot better so again I thought huh that's interesting so it was just sort of process over a long period of time of noticing where the prevailing ideas in the culture I was living in just were not helpful in terms of understanding my menstruating body and that The more I looked at other cultures for information and followed my own body, the better I I became physically and emotionally. And I discovered all kinds of things. So that went into my first book, uh, which came out when I was in my early 30s. And so that was in 1993. It was published. And then after that, I carried on doing bits of work with menstruation here and there, giving talks and sometimes being invited to advise on something. I consulted on various projects in various fields, but nothing really solid, no no way of really making a living from it, shall we say, or being involved in it full time until around 2010, 2011, which as we all know is when things started to change in terms of menstruation. And it really began to generate some capital of its own. So it started to become possible to actually be paid for doing things. I mean, I had been paid for bits I'd done before, but not consistently. I was always having to do other work to make a living. And then I got invited to go to Australia and head up a pretty large research project for a couple of years. And when I was doing that, I met some academics at a big university there and really liked them a lot and had some great conversations with them. And and then one day I said, oh, I think I probably should do a PhD because I tried to do one before, but I could never find the, that magic combination of an institution and supervisors who knew anything about it. And they'd just done a lot of research on menopause. So they were pretty clued up. 
but they were in a business school. So it was this big sort of surprise to me that I would end up in a business school because it was the last place I would ever thought I'd, I'd have been. I mean, I had a history. My first degree was in history. And so I found myself doing a discipline called organization studies, which is actually absolutely fascinating and starting to explore menstruation from a socioeconomic point of view, which is really what made up a lot of that talk that you saw in 2017. It was really about menstruation as a part of life, which has very little capital. And why is that? And what the effect that has on women's lives? Yeah. And then since then I've been, I've been working full time. So really for the last 10 years, I've been working full time on menstruation and um, it's just such a fascinating topic. It's so rich and so Mm -hmm. understudied. There's so much work still needs to be done. So well, I, I remember, I mean, it's been several years, but I, I feel like some of the concepts that I still remember to this day from your talk were when you were talking about reproductive labor and just this whole mm-hmm. idea of the unpaid work that's happening related to reproduction that women are having to deal with. And um, I've had, there's a, an organization in Toronto, I believe it's called the Period Purse. And I think one of their main focuses is on making menstrual products accessible to women who have no income or low income, such as women who are, if I believe, if I remember correctly, women who are incarcerated, homeless women, and just these, these issues that you don't think about until you think about it. And then you realize, well, if you're homeless, there's no free pads anywhere. And so literally, what do you do? And so, I mean, I think I'll I'll probably jump around today with my questions, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about the economic implications of menstruation and what you've found in your research around some of those types of issues? Oh, there's so much to talk about in this terrain. I mean, yes, there's the big picture of reproductive labor being unpaid in our society. So, and and women suffer um, an economic burden because of that. And that's one of the main reasons why women have um, smaller pensions than men and generally throughout their lifespan have less money than men do even though they're often working a full-time job, being pregnant, having periods, lactating, nursing children, going through menopause. And all of these things constitute reproductive labor because without them, we would have no human race. And they themselves take a lot of work, take a lot of energy, take a lot of time. And we have to do this extra shift, if you like, on top of everything else. Plus, women usually do more of the domestic labour than men do. Um, in most developed countries, it's it's between um, two thirds and three quarters of the domestic labour in a home is done by the woman. So that's iniquitous to start with. But then when you look at people who are disadvantaged, who really have, have maybe they, they could have mental health problems, physical health problems, They may be having a run of bad luck. Uh, They may have been being abused. There's all kinds of reasons that see people kind of hit the bottom and not be able to afford to live. And and then to have the um, indignity of not being able to afford tampons or pads is just awful. So it's great that quite a lot of countries are now addressing this issue. And for the last two years, I've been involved in a research project on the period products bill in Scotland, which was passed uh, a year ago, which enshrines in law the right of everybody to have access to period products for free. Everyone, everyone in Scotland. So in Scotland, the local councils provide products for schools and hospitals and in public toilets. You'll find free products and anybody who wants them can ask for them to be sent to them as well. So that just, apart from the fact that it resolves a financial issue for some women, it also is just a big signal that you should not be penalized for having a period. And as a society, we will support you in having your period. And that this isn't something to be ashamed of or that you have to hide. Look, we've discussed it in the House of Houses of Parliament. You know, we talked about it in the House of Commons or in the Scottish Parliament anyway. And we they made a unanimous decision. Nobody objected to this new law. So, you know, that and I th- I'm sure that that will happen and is planned to be happening in other places as well. So it's been very interesting to study that and also to see what the politicians gain from it. 
because it's actually a fairly inexpensive way um, of looking like a really forward thinking, you know, country, really progressive, but it's pretty cheap way of doing that. So that's so interesting to me and about Scotland. And, you know, because I've been saying it for years that I do believe menstrual products should be free and available to everybody. And it's interesting. So I'm curious, like, is, are they, were they the first country like officially to do this? And was this a hard thing for it to come to pass? Like what had to happen in the background for this to take place? It, I think it took about three years from when the idea first came up, two or three years. And there were certain stumbling blocks like issues around, well, what about people who don't actually live here? Would people come over the border from England and sort of raid public toilets to take the menstrual products back? But generally it was it was adopted with a great deal of um, goodwill and positivity and an understanding that menstrual stigma is a real thing that blights women's lives and that, uh, you know, a progressive country should do everything they can to try and ameliorate that. So I have one more kind of question. I just thought it was really interesting when you were talking about it, that you mentioned that it was cheap. You know, like I mentioned, you mentioned that it was not this, this thing that required a lot of money to be able to basically completely change the lives of many women who wouldn't necessarily have access to menstrual products. And I thought, what are your thoughts on that? Because in, in one way, I look at it and think, you know, about all the other countries in the world, like what's your excuse kind of thing? Well, what I meant was that it's a relatively cheap way to shift your reputation. So what happens to a country if they say all the women get free period products is they get a lot of goodwill from women constituents, right? So politicians look progressive, they look woman friendly, they look thoughtful. It's, it's a really, and the other thing that happened in Scotland, which is really interesting, and you can see this, some of my colleagues have done detailed work on the language used uh, in the bill and in the conversations in parliament around the bill in the Scottish parliament. It was, it's also been used as a way to separate Scotland from England because England doesn't have a service like this. So Scotland looks better vis-a-vis -vis its neighbour. And that's a big thing at the moment because of Scottish independence, all the conversation around that. And um, it wasn't a Scottish nationalist MP who brought the act forward. It was a Labour MP, actually. But one of the reasons there was that the parliament was unanimous about voting for this act was, yes, it protects and helps women and menstruators, but it also enhances Scotland's reputation mm -hmm. and and Scotland is feeling itself more and more as a nation that might be going to separate mm. from England so you start to see these interesting conversations about the national identity and what does you know what does it mean to be Scottish being allied to this idea about period products and part of that idea about being Scottish is being innovative and being the first to do something being a pioneering country that's you know special and ahead of the head of the curve so that's what I meant by well it's a relatively cheap way to achieve all of that political power really hmm. and of course if you're buying menstrual products at cost um, not at retail if you're buying them at wholesale cost then obviously it's going to be cheaper they were also very smart and they allied with small scottish startup companies who were creating organic or sustainable products so they didn't go to the big multinationals like procter and gamble and kimberly clark they went to local companies that were employing local people and who were doing it, making products sustainably. So they were ticking all kinds of boxes while they were going through this exercise and really showing that they were thinking very clearly about all aspects of this and how it would benefit Scotland. Hmm. You know, that's really interesting. I feel like on the one hand, it sounds like, you know, it's not just about helping the women, right? It sounds like we're getting something out of it. This is going to be good for our public perception and all of these great things. So on the one hand, that seems kind of negative because like, no, it should be about women's health, right? It should be, about, <laughs> it should be about, but on the other hand, I feel like for other countries, places, nations, even on a smaller scale, 
that could be useful for the grassroots organizers to know what's in it for them so that when they position oh, you know, these it, types of requests, <laughs> yeah, to make it more of a win, because it does make sense. I mean, it is helpful to have something in it for the people that are doing it as well. Yeah. And I mean, it, the other thing that you said that was really interesting, you know, before was that they were afraid that we were going to cross the border and steal the period products. And I, I mean, I've heard that analogy with so many different examples, like providing free condoms in high schools, like everyone's going to go steal the condoms. But I'm, I'm like, who goes to the store and steals toilet paper? Like when something is made readily available, I feel like it kind of falls into the background. Um, That's right. People don't very that. often steal toilet paper from public toilets, do they? I mean, they do sometimes, but it's not something that people are afraid of, you know, that toilet paper will be stolen. Right. <laughs> so having period products in a public toilet is sort of an equivalent thing. I mean, no one thinks there shouldn't be toilet paper and that we should all be carrying our own toilet paper around. Right. But we are supposed to be carrying our menstrual products around. Mm -hmm. So where you need them is in is in the bathroom. So they should be in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Makes sense. So, yes, it, it, I think that that fear about people coming over from England to steal them was also part of the discussion around the border, the concept of the border and, you know, who is allowed to have these things. So this idea about national identity is quite an interesting part of uh, the whole issue. Mm -hmm. I feel like this topic kind of then leads us potentially into talking about, I guess, the way that the menstrual cycle is commodified. You know, I'm sure that you have a lot to say about that. From my perspective as a fertility awareness ed educator, over the past 20 years, it's been really interesting to see the ways that tech companies are kind of capitalizing on the cycle. So when I first started charting, there were no apps. My phone had like a green screen. <laughs> there were no smartphones. To see going from, a, you know, a, a very modest Excel spreadsheet that I printed on my own printer to hundreds, if not thousands of period tracking apps and devices and thermometers. And this is one of the most common questions I get asked of every interview that I do and with clients, you know, which tech do you recommend and things like that. Uh, so maybe share your thoughts. I mean, that's just one aspect of the menstrual tech, but maybe share your thoughts on this industry. Like, is it good or bad that they're trying to make money off of this stuff? Oh boy. I mean, you know, there's so much to say here. I suppose the, the part of this that I have studied the most is how stigma nonetheless gets reproduced. So there may be the best of intentions, but if you're not really aware of how menstrual stigma works, it's very easy to reproduce it through these various femtech solutions. So there's quite a lot of that. For example, the word sanitary is still used a lot. You know, you still find you find new companies that think they're doing something really hip and great, and they're still calling menstrual products sanitary products. They're still sometimes talking about hygiene. And there seems to be, it seems quite slow, really, for that understanding to catch on that the term sanitary and hygiene being attached to menstrual products is, is a direct result of the stigma surrounding menstrual blood and the idea that menstrual blood is somehow dirtier than any other kind of blood or bodily fluid. And then this translates into, into various other things that even the word period, like in the, in the Scottish Act, the Scottish Act is called the Period Products Act. And the act itself only contains, I think this is right, the word menstruation once and the word menstrual once and all the rest of the time it's period. And of course, period is itself a euphemism. So we've, we've totally normalized it now and it seems, why would you object to the word period? But the word period actually is also applicable to something else. It's not a distinct word for menstruation. And why can't we actually use the word menstruation or menstrual? Why not? Because it's stigmatized and people are uncomfortable with the word and they don't really want to say it. So period is easier to say. So then you see an actual act of parliament is doing the same thing. So this is very slippery, this stuff, but menstrual stigma itself is very sticky. It, it stays. You have to work really hard to dismantle it. Um, so that's something that I've been tracking um, through the changes to menstrual advertising, some of which I think are great, but some of which are just are just about really changing one kind of stigma for something slightly different. 
but it's still it's still stigmatized. Anyway, there's there's so many different examples of ways in which this becomes a very mixed bag and you have to be really alert to to track what's going on. I feel like that's a really interesting observation because typically when you think of tech, you think of it being advanced and cutting edge and all of these things. Uh, And I suppose that's one of my critiques with some of the tech, because from my perspective, looking at the menstrual cycle from the fertility awareness angle, when I look at these period tracker apps, they have rebranded the rhythm method (laughs) because instead of teaching women about the cycle, they basically bring her into, okay, we're just going to calculate the average of your ovulation and predict. They're calculating it and they're telling her when she's going to be fertile instead of actually getting the right information from her. Mm -hmm. And there's positives to that, you know, in the sense that for many women, this is the first introduction to this language. And so for a lot of people, this is bringing them into this world of, okay, there's more to this. Oh, what's this mucus button. Right. But there's still that piece of it that that's there where it's, it's simply kind of highlighting the stereotypes that were already there (laughs) instead of breaking them or, or challenging them. So it's a really interesting observation that you made, because I never really thought about it that way, but it makes perfect sense because the tech is tech and the people who make the tech are part of the culture. Yep. That's right. And they might be getting a device, but they themselves aren't menstrual researchers or, you know, particularly knowledgeable necessarily about this kind of stuff. And I mean, what's the motivation for these products? I feel like this is something that is probably a good line of thinking to go through for a lot of products but we often think that these products are going to make our lives better, easier, et cetera. But what was the actual motivation for making these products? You know, I I often wonder that myself. Well, they were asked to do it. I mean, Apple, for example, on their health, you know, you could track all kinds of things, but you couldn't track your period. And women did say, Hey, hang on a minute. You know, this is, this isn't right. So they were asked for it. There's been quite a lot of concern about the way that information could be used, whether it could be used by, right-wing jurisdictions who want to know when a woman's missed a period and did that mean she was pregnant and then you know did she do something about it I mean there's some very scary new laws like in Texas for example at the moment so there's been concerns about that yeah there's a sort of handmade tail kind of element to it about big brother knowing what's happening with your menstrual cycle so that's I think that's a, a reasonable concern to keep in the background and then the other thing is, is that it makes people use their phone more and anything that makes you use your phone more, right, is an advantage to that whole industry. And they've, you know, the phones are incredibly successful at getting us to be addicted to them. It's yeah. remarkable. <laughs> I mean, how, how come I look at this thing for a scary amount of hours a day? You know, when I used to manage quite well without one, not that That's long true. ago. There's some listeners that probably can't imagine that, but I mean, I got my first cell phone when I was like 18 or 19 years old. I think I was charting my cycle before I had a cell phone, (laughs) very possibly. (laughs) Yeah. 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 No, that's, it's, it's just so interesting to think about for me, when I think about what is the motivation of it, you know, obviously with tech, you're selling a product, like there's a financial interest in it. It's a very creative endeavor, but ultimately it's kind of modern, you're trying to modernize, you know, the menstrual cycle or, or whatever it is. And one of the things I think is interesting as well, and I'm not sure. Okay. So I'll just kind of go with this thought and then let me know what you think, but you know, much of this tech, maybe it's a little bit different now, but I think that they're, you know, largely still often made by men, you know, they might have female advisors. I know some of the companies are founded by women and things like that. So there's certainly that, but a lot of this tech is founded by men. And not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but I think I'll give you one example that comes to mind again, because I'm always thinking about the cycle and everything. So a lot of the period tracker apps were kind of generic, you know, and now there's more, you know, women led companies that are making it. And those versions tend to be a little bit different, incorporate more specific kind of things, a little bit more nuanced, and it could just be part of the field itself evolving and all of that kind of stuff. But do you have any thoughts on that? You know, with maybe this is not the best avenue for that, because for example, menstrual cups, I feel like, I feel like that's a lot of women led kind of companies that are, are doing those types of things. So do you have any thoughts on that with regards to femtech? Like, is it a lot of men making products for women or is it kind of more of a mixed bag? I don't actually know, but there are more men in that industry. 
but I haven't done research on that. But one thing I do know is that autocorrect still won't spell menstrual or menstruation. It's true, you know. I still have to write them out every time. And these are words I use a lot, you know, so it would be convenient to recognize them. So, and a lot of words related to women just aren't in autocorrect. So that's either deliberate or just an omission due to ignorance. I wanted to pop in with a quick message from today's sponsor, Audible. Did you know that you can listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Yes, it's there's a lot that's happening in the menstrual sphere at the moment, which is really paradoxical. And this is one of those areas. You know, my research on menstrual cups, I don't know whether you've read read that or seen that, but I found this really paradoxical finding, which was that during the day, the women who used the menstrual cups who I studied really found that they didn't have to think about their period all day because for most of them, they could go all day with the cup without having to change it. So once they learned how to put the cup in so it was comfortable, they would not feel the cup all day. They wouldn't have to carry any products with them when they had their period. And they, while they were out at work, most of them said, it's like I don't have a period, which is fantastic. So there's this desire, which is very common across society in developed countries, to minimize the experience of menstruation. To The best thing is if you can imagine you're not having a period when you are having a period. So you kind of disappear the period. But then when they got home and they took the cup out, then they had a more direct encounter with their menstrual blood because it had been kept in an anaerobic environment. So it's not like blood on a tampon or a pad, which is dried and some oxygen's got to it or whatever. But because of the suction of the cup, it's kept completely pristine in its original state. So they would see their blood and in a way be kind of faced of looking at their own vital fluid, what was inside their body shown to them exactly as it was inside, but it's in this cup that they're holding in their hand and then they're pouring it away. And that encounter with the blood when they got home at night was much, much more vivid than any encounter with a tampon or a pad. So it became this really interesting experience where during the day, it's like there's no period. They would describe it as if it's so fantastic, it's so convenient, it's as if I'm not having my period. But then get home, deal with the cup. Oh my God, I'm not just having a period. There's this incredible bright red blood that looks like I haven't really seen this, like especially for the younger ones, seen this much blood, this bright red before. And oh my God, this is like a, a thing. So I thought that was really fascinating on in various ways. And I, and I think the same thing is happening in a sense through the apps, which is that You input your information into an app or the app calculates and spits it back to you and says you are going to be fertile on, you know, the 20th and 21st of March or whatever. So in a sense, you've outsourced your own body awareness to an app. The app now knows more about you than you do. Right? It's calculating who, you know, when you're going to ovulate and in a sense who you are, you know, what mood you're going to be on a certain day. The app is pre-judging that. And of course, it may be accurate. It may not be. But it's probably doing quite a good job because, you know, the menstrual cycle is reasonably predictable if you've mapped it over a period of time, as you know. So in a sense, you've outsourced it, which is, again, this kind of minimization. It's the convenience. Someone else is tracking your cycle for you, in this case, an app. They're doing the work. You don't have to. But in another sense, because you've got that information, you actually are more in touch with the cycle and with the process. So similar to the cup, yeah, you can disappear your period for 12 hours, but then you have this encounter with it, which is kind of magnified. So I think this is really interesting. It's sort of disrupting the idea or the experience of a period that people used to have, which would be a mix of embarrassment, shyness, uncertainty, worry about leaking, 
But on the other hand, it was totally yours because it was a private thing that happened. So you kind of owned it in a way. Once you have an app, in a sense, you're not owning it. Apple owns it or whoever. I so, don't know if that's something people realize. No, they don't probably, but they they must feel it because it feels different, doesn't it? Well, and you I've know? seen, so you've probably seen it as well. Some giant studies have come out with very, yeah. very interesting oh, data yeah. because this, you know, especially the apps that are free or the apps that don't necessarily tell you about the data part of it. There has to be money in that. There's a study that is coming to mind. Haven't looked at it for a while. I think oh, there's a lot of money in that. Yeah. That, but that data is incredibly valuable. And, and they we say on the studies, like from apps, like they'll tell you. Yeah. So yeah, all yeah, of yeah. this input, so they can have 600,000 menstrual cycles of data making for a very, very interesting study. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we learned a lot about menstruation through COVID, through what was yeah. happening on apps. So yeah, no, it's an incredible resource for, for data. But it is then, this is another aspect of it, that in a sense, women's reproductive system is not individual, it's collective, right? We are a human race, we're a species of mammal, and we reproduce through women's bodies. And so the act of reproducing and all of the things that go along with it, which includes having a period, is not only individual, it is also collective. And in a way, the apps sort of make that very visible because women are giving that data and it actually is contributing to more collective knowledge about menstruation and fertility. So I think that's and that's also something about the experience of social media, too. It's got a whole negative side that we know about and the whole pylons and people are much nastier and all the rest of it, which is dreadful. But at the same time, we're having a shared experience, not only in our own village or tribe or town or city or country, but the whole world. So the whole world at the moment is collectively traumatized by what's happening in Ukraine. And because Ukraine is a developed country and it's very plugged in and it's got this amazingly savvy president who really knows how to do social media, we're all actually seeing what it's like for a, a country to be invaded and bombed in a way that we've never collectively witnessed that before. I know I'm going way off our topic, but I'm just thinking about how about this relationship between the individual and the collective. And I think this is something that doesn't really get talked about enough. And menstruation is a really good example of it, that technology is just completely altering that. So for women having their periods tracked, a big part of doing it could be being very open about the data sharing and saying, by using this app, you are contributing to research that will benefit people all over the world, potentially. And that maybe engaging people's desire to be a contributor to the collective is actually what we're really missing. Because when we start to do that, people get really happy. Like what's just happened here, they just announced this program where you could give a room to a Ukrainian refugee. And there's this huge outpouring of people wanting to offer help. And that's an aspect of modern life, which we don't have enough of. Mm -hmm. because we've been trained to be individualized because capitalism wants us to be individuals. It doesn't want us to share our lawnmowers or whatever. We've each got to have one of our own, right? Mm -hmm. Which is ridiculous because it's not necessary, but that's what capitalism does. We all end up owning too much stuff because we're supposed to have something of everything for ourselves, which is insane way to organize a culture, a society. It's completely barking mad, but that's what capitalism insists upon. And, and we experience a loss at a soul level, I think, through that, because, yes, we're all independent, but then we're on our own in our houses or just in our nuclear family, which is OK up to a point. But something is lost in that. Mm -hmm. Well, you had a kind of I don't know if this is related necessarily, but but I think that so you had mentioned that in 2010, things were really different and things started to change. And I can't help but wonder, as kind of as it pertains to the to what you were mentioning. So at the beginning of my fertility awareness journey, there was no connectivity with the world regarding my period. <laughs> it was not a thing that took place. And even around, so I started this podcast in 2014. 
And even that was this interesting thing where before podcasts, I mean, I'm sure podcasts existed way before I started mine, but they weren't necessarily popularized that much. Kind well, of the technology wasn't time. there to make them easily available to people as well. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone did not have a phone <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. uh, before, but that is so interesting too, because even just this type of medium that exists where anybody can open up and talk about whatever they want, then it does kind of create this these subcultures within the culture. I think that's something that's really different Yeah, with social true. media. So for example, your social media feed and my social media feed and anyone else who's like, no one has the same social media feed. Yeah. We're yeah. basically living our lives, li- literally looking at different news, different information, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I guess that kind of brings me to a question. I'm kind of meandering around here, but for you, when you mentioned that things had really changed you know, did this play a part of it? What do you think changed around that time okay. to really bring I've, periods I've looked to looked at this quite a bit. So I think there are three main reasons. So one is social media and the technology that goes along with it. So the the smartphone came in when 2011, 2012? Probably the smartphone, or was it a little bit earlier? It's somewhere around there. Maybe it's 2010. I'm not sure. But we already had social media was already booming by that point so what that meant was when the global financial crisis happened in 20 2007 2008 and that really ran until 2010 as a we'll fall out from it that that highlighted inequalities and it really it gave a lot of people um, the impetus to become activists of one sort or another so you got the occupy movement particularly starting then with Occupy Wall Street and then various offshoots. And there was an Occupy menstruation, actually, that was going on for a while. There was a Facebook account called that. I don't think it exists anymore. Might do. And so when you put those two things together, so this new impetus for activism and exposing inequalities that really came out of the global financial crisis, plus social media, meaning that activists can organise themselves much more effectively, communicate between each other, But then the thing that also affected menstruation was that actually, and this is a little bit complicated, but neoliberal capitalism, so free market capitalism, anything goes, you know, you can have pornography all over the internet, you can sell anything you want, you can say anything you want, you can do things on television that were unimaginable 10 years before, Um, you can have reality TV shows where people are basically naked all the time and this neoliberal version of capitalism loves to break taboos because when you break a taboo, you enable a new market. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting way to look at it, but it's so true. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to feel old in my age because I can remember when, like, I, I don't really watch TV. So if I do, you know, happen to see something. It's, do you remember when people had to wear clothes? Well, <laughs> and remember how after a certain time, like in prime time, they literally wouldn't put on a certain type of yeah. material. Yeah. The watershed, what is it called? The watershed, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember when, uh, I remember when pornography started coming onto the internet in the 90s, I was living in LA and I started to encounter people who were talking about it and, you know, watching pornography became like this normal thing, like it was watching television. And I thought, God, this is really, this is really a shift because I grew up in a world where pornography was okay. There might, well, by the 80s, there were videos starting, I suppose. But in the 70s, it was just magazines. Yeah. It's a very different proposition to watching live people on a screen, you know, doing stuff. I remember going, being taken by a boyfriend to see the Emmanuel movie, which was incredibly soft porn as these things now go. And I, I found it kind of nauseating to watch. I didn't really want to watch that. It just felt really weird. It wasn't part, I hadn't grown up with that idea at all. And it was very new in the culture. And then... By the late 90s, you've got it starting to be normalized. And then it just becomes that everybody is not everybody, but young people, that's where they're getting their sexual information from, which is really distorted. How people refer to smartphones. It's porn in your pocket. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, because everything's available. So if you have a teenager who has a cell phone of their own, and you haven't necessarily had that conversation, absolutely. It's 24 hours a day, all day, every day. Yeah, and, and this is a boys. massive industry. This is billions and billions and billions of dollars, right, in this industry. So this is that's a really good example of neoliberal capitalism really embracing the dismantling of taboos because you get these huge markets opening up. 
And so menstruation is actually just another of those things, because by the time the menstrual taboo, people started talking about, we're smashing the taboo. Boringly, they still do. Can you believe it? People are still saying, and we're the ones who are smashing the taboo. It's like, you're too late. But anyway, um, it was like, oh, yeah, it's just another taboo. We'll just smash it because that's what we do now. Because if we do that, then we'll find a way to make money from it. And do you think that so now do you think yeah. that we're in a better place? So is this like, are we good now with, men- what, like, with menstruation like- or yeah. in general with menstruation, so I think, with menstruation? I think we're in a much better place, but the reason I think we're in a much better place is not because we enabled new markets and smashed a taboo or whatever. I think we're in a better place, but because the taboo has been being dismantled and there were these, these various factors that I just spoke about that contributed to that, and it's still ongoing, obviously, we've got a lot more academic research happening. So I've tracked how much academic research has got menstrual in the title, for example. And, you know, it was just like a couple of hundred papers in the 60s. And then in the 70s, you get about 300. It's sort of the graph goes up gradually. And then from 2000, it starts to go up steeply. And then from 2010, it doubles from everything that had been done before. We've got a lot more knowledge. We're producing more knowledge about menstruation because the taboo has been dismantled. Because academia, like anything else in a capitalist society, you know, you need money to be able to do it. And you can capitalize menstruation much more easily now because it's not such a taboo. There's not as much stigma attached to it. So that's a big upside. Um, we now know a lot more about uh, menstrual symptoms like endometriosis. There's still a lot more that we need to understand. And, but there's so much more interest and awareness in this now that fewer women are suffering in silence. Mm-hmm. And that's the big win because there has been so much unnecessary suffering surrounding menstruation. And that was one of the main reasons I got involved in it in the first place. And I've seen a significant shift in my lifetime around that, and it's going to get better. Well, and so we're finding out more. Well, and Mm -hmm. your, your experience, then you feel that the average, this has trickled down to the average woman. You feel that at this point or. Yes. I think that there are more options available. There's discussions now about workplace policies. There's more of an idea that actually people should be compassionate around it, but more than that, that, Having a, having a menstrual cycle is a natural thing and people shouldn't be penalized for it. And if you're symptomatic, then, you know, you should have time off if you need it or be encouragement to go and see your doctor or whatever you need. So, yes, this isn't affecting everybody. People still work in awful circumstances where they're not allowed to go to the toilet when they want to or whatever. But I think in general, there's more awareness around it. It's something you can talk about now. When I was younger, you couldn't talk about it even. Mm -hmm. Everything had to be secretive and quiet and hidden. And you had to really act as if you were not menstruating when you were menstruating, which just added to the discomfort. So I think that's a big improvement. But I think that what is missing, perhaps, is the, the idea that the slowing down that naturally happens is actually a good thing and a positive thing and something to embrace rather than to try and get around in some way. Because we live in a society that is kind of addicted to productivity and speed and work and busyness and caffeine and, uh, you know, which is getting us into a lot of trouble one way or another. So that internal experience, that slowing down, that really, those really interesting states of mind that can come with your period when you do slow down that's all really 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 precious and I think that's getting very little attention at the moment because it doesn't fit the mainstream idea of what a successful life is like you know which is being constantly on and constantly doing Mm -hmm. well there's one more question I want to ask you before we start wrapping up and talking a little bit about your course I think this is going to be very exciting to the listeners, because there's so much interest in this topic, as you know, there's plenty of practitioners and obviously lots of different people that listen to this show. But one of the things that you said that was really interesting in our pre-chat, uh, when I asked you what, just kind of some questions around different topics, you said something really interesting. You said something about the red tent 
and kind of this fantasy world around menstruation that doesn't necessarily match the reality. And, you know, I remember in my twenties reading that book, The Red Tent by Anita Diamond and falling into this fantasy. They kind of wrote it alongside. So kind of like a fictional account alongside biblical, uh, a biblical account to, to make it feel like you're, you know, in this time when this, there was this amazing kind of counterculture of uh, menstruation, <laughs> which likely didn't necessarily exist. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I just I'm really curious to hear your your thoughts around that. Well, there's there's two main strands to my thinking around it. One is that the in certain circles that the fantasy of the red tent is very powerful, and and people want to believe that there was a time when women used to go to literal red tents. There's no historical evidence of this, but it's a beautiful symbol, and what's happening now is really interesting because people are, women are gathering in red tents. They're creating red tents and that are nurturing spaces for women to gather and talk not only about their periods, not only be menstruating, but also to work on lots of issues like domestic abuse and, you know, PTSD and various other other things, and I know of communities where the red tent is is a sort of has become a you know like a community resource where people support each other and um, particularly around women's issues. So that's really lovely. What I find a bit troubling because troubling because I'm a bit of a history nerd is is that people think that they're doing something that was done hundreds of years ago in a very literal sense that, yeah, there were red tents and we've revived them. Well, no, we haven't revived them. Actually, we've created them. Anita Diamond thought thought up the idea of the red tent. And this is very much a contemporary phenomenon, which is, I think it's, it's beautiful. You don't have to believe in a glorious past, distant past that we somehow lost in order to experience what's happening in the present. And I think sometimes we fail to understand the extraordinary world we've created because we tend to have fantasies about past times in the past that were somehow better. And oftentimes we don't really know whether they were better or not. And then the other aspect to it, I can't remember what the other thing was now. I was going to say your editor is going to have to help me with this bit. Um, What was the other strand? So one was the red tents now. Uh, What was the other thing I said earlier? Do you remember? I don't remember, but um, I'll just kind of comment though on yeah on what you I'll said because because I remember I distinctly remember reading the book. I think Anita Diamant is an incredible writer because I remember feeling like I was there. Um, it took you, if I remember correctly, it's been years. It took you to the life of Dinah, <laughs> and and I believe there's a Dinah in the actual Bible. Um, yeah, the, the daughter of somebody. Oh um, yes, they're all characters from the Bible in the book. Yeah, yeah. which made it feel even more real. And yeah. so, and it took you to when she was in the womb to after she died, it took you through her whole life and you felt like you were there. Uh, so I love how you basically call it out and say, no, no, that's not a historical thing, ladies. <laughs> well, but, but I think what I find interesting as well about it is that we, we all have this tendency to imagine the past and reimagine the past in different ways. And, and I think with the red tent, what I'm interested in is not having that be a distraction that, oh, there was this lovely time in the past. We have to try and get a little piece of that now in order to feel a bit more balanced. But instead to really think about, OK, what are the ways in which we're collectively living and expecting each other to live that actually don't allow us to experience a red tent now? And part of it is this addiction to perfection, whether it's our bodies or our actions or whatever, we expect so much of ourselves, I think, in a way that's just really unhealthy. And a lot of the stress that people experience is very much related to that. So there's this sort of tendency to not accept ourselves as we are. And believe me, I think personal development's great and, you know, we can all do things to improve. But I think that's gone, that's got out of balance. And again, that's been commodified. So the desire to live the best life you can live, which is a great desire, has actually become much more concerned with commodities than it's become concerned with the inner self. And so 
the romanticization around the red tent, we have to watch that a bit because that can become another thing that we we sort of detach from reality around. And we, we do a lot of detaching from reality in our current society because there's so much that's unbearable. There's so much about capitalism itself that is actually unbearable at a soul level because it demands so much from us. I mean, the cost of a house, to afford a house, it's like a major heroic act to be able to have it your own now. home. Whereas in pre-capitalist societies, you know, in general, people have homes. There aren't homeless people unless things are very badly organized. Generally, homes are available one way or another. Um, so there's certain ways in which our humanity gets lost in the fight for wealth. And, you know, I mean, these are these are big topics you can talk about endlessly and there's no easy solution. What I'm interested in is where menstruation fits in to those particular issues. And what I see with the red tent is that it's a really valuable and really symbolic idea. And in itself, it has a kind of perfection and it doesn't need to be located as a real thing that happened in the past because it wasn't a real thing that happened in the past. Uh, things like it may have happened, but they weren't red tents, probably. Well, it's kind of this idea that like things were so much better back then. Exactly. We were so much more exactly. in tune with our bodies. I kind of exactly. wonder about that sometimes, the idea yeah. that women were so much more in tune with their bodies back then, because I don't necessarily, I have, I'm not it's like I haven't studied the history. So this is literally just coming out of my <laughs> imagination here, but I don't necessarily believe that, you know, I think that there may have been more of an understanding in general without any hormonal influence, but in terms of the level that I teach people in my programs, you know, I just don't think there was a time when that level of detail would have been available, but I could be wrong. Well, you know, I, I think there were societies that were more intelligent than the other ones. And <laughs> yeah. some places it was better to be on the planet than other places, but Largely, people didn't live as long. You know, women were more likely to die in childbirth. You know, vaccinations yeah. were a really good thing. Yeah. There was a lot of a lot of grief. I mean, if you look at the average person's family tree and you go back one century, there were babies dying left, right and centre. Women had even more complicated reproductive lives than they do today. There's a lot to be said for the world we live in now. Yeah. You're going to ask me a question about the course. Yes. Okay. Well, so I just want to congratulate you on your new course. Um, I have the link in front of me, Contemporary Menstrual Studies, an inter Interdisciplinary Foundation Year for Advanced Study and Practice. So you've created a master's level course on menstruation. You know, I feel like at the beginning of your career, would you have thought that this is where it would have led you? I think it's really fascinating, such a great accomplishment. And also, I think it's really timely because I feel like this is a time when a lot of women are really wanting to dive into it in a more academic fashion, you know, to give it the, the true due that it deserves. So maybe tell us a little bit about what inspired you to create this course, who would be a good fit to take it and what you, your intended students will be learning and how it would benefit them. So uh, the inspiration to create the course was uh, people started asking me to do it basically. So I do mentor people working in the field of menstruation and a couple of people said that they wanted to know more about what I knew. And I, I knew that I'd done an enormous amount of study in the last few years and nobody needs to reinvent that wheel every time so that I could help people learn that faster than, than it took me. And also, I have a, a passion for wanting to professionalize the field. And so I could see that there were people working in business, in healthcare, in uh, menstrual activism, who didn't know some of the information that actually is available. There was a bit of a gap between the academic research and what was happening in the field more broadly. And so I wanted to bridge that gap. And I also wanted to bring in this sort of, you could call it more spiritual, but more holistic aspect of menstruation too, because that I thought was also getting left out. So it is kind of a bridging exercise of bringing different aspects of the field together, but I'm bringing them together through the lens of academic research and 
looking at what we already know, what we don't know, and how that might be studied. So the people who are joining the course are people who are planning on doing PhDs, but they're not sure what they want their topic to be. Um, so they're doing it as a preparatory course. People who work in menstrual activism, whether it's for NGOs or for different kinds of organizations who want to be more knowledgeable and become better communicators. People who have studied in the menstruality movement and who are working as menstrual educators and advisors and menstrual coaches, but who realize that there's a whole, a whole big chunk of information that they just don't have. So one of the things I'm doing is, is teaching people who haven't necessarily had an academic education beyond an undergraduate degree. So they don't really know about research methods and theories uh, that are used in menstrual studies so that they can get to the point where they can read an academic paper and really understand where it sits in the canon, what it's actually doing, what, what it's contributing to, how good the research is, and whether it's reliable or not. So just really to, to raise the level of knowledge in the field. So that's the aim of the course. And I've got this first course is starting on Sunday. So that's March 20th. So maybe that's the, I don't know when this podcast will come out. So probably after that. So the course will already have started. And I've got just a fantastic group of women have come together to study on the course from, I think, um, nine countries now, four continents. So it's going to be a really interesting cohort. And that was the other thing I wanted to do was bring a cohort of people together who would study together and support each other. Uh, from around the world and from different parts of the menstrual field just to improve the, the connections, really. And there's no course like this being taught anywhere in the world, as far as I know, and there's nothing at university level. So I've designed it like a university course. So it's two semesters, there are assignments, there are lectures, there are tutorials. It's all being taught online, obviously, because people are all over the world, but it's, it, it's very much like a university course. So that will help prepare people who are going to go further into more postgraduate work. But it also means that the certificate at the end will be meaningful, you know, within that paradigm. Uh, and if at some point a university wants to run the course, then I can teach it in that context. But it's actually working really well for me to teach it privately. It's gone really well. So, yeah, I'm really mm -hmm. pleased to be doing it. And is it, it like a live so, course or are you... It's teaching. live. The lectures are recorded so that people who can't make the lecture can watch it. The um, seminars aren't recorded so that people feel free to ask daft questions or whatever. You know, it's not that's not going to be that shouldn't be recorded. And there's two different ones for people living in different time zones. Um, yes. It, it, otherwise, it's all online. There's a certain amount of self-study and, you know, a couple of longer assignments, essays. But I'm also including things like the first assignment is to start your journal for the course. So this is something that often gets missed out of traditional education is really bringing the whole person in to the education. And, and part of what you should be studying when you study is yourself studying. You should be studying yourself so that you find out what am I really fascinated by? What do I find easy? What's difficult? What do I really need to learn here? Um, what really grabs me and that I might want to stick with later on? What confuses me? Where are my misunderstandings? So that those questions are not something that happens by happenstance, but you're actually looking for them as you're going through the study. And of course, some students will do that anyway, but I think it offered that part of learning often needs a bit of help. And so I integrate it into the course. And then later on, there'll be an assignment about the journals and so, because that's a really, really important part of integrating your learning. Otherwise, it's quite easy to take a course and go, oh, that was interesting at the time, but have I really integrated it? Do I really, is it really become part of me? Mm -hmm. Well, and a couple more practical questions for the listeners yeah. who might want to jump in. So is it annual? Is there a cutoff to registration? And then if, if they miss this cohort, can they jump into the next one? How does that yes. work? Well, there's a little bit of leeway because the lecture on, on March 20th will be recorded. So people could join as late as 
March 26th, because the first live seminar will be on March 27th, which they would have to attend. The next course will begin in 2023. And probably around the same time of year, I may do it a little bit earlier, but I have a, a book deadline and various other things. So it'll probably be around the same time. And yeah, I'm planning on running it annually. We'll see how it goes. But um, so far, it's looking good and I'm thrilled to be teaching it. Great. Well, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about it. I'll be sure to link the details in the show notes page. Laura, thank you so much for being here today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Uh, And I'm excited to hear more about your book when that comes out. I heard a little bit about that. So uh, we'll be happy to have you back uh, when that time comes around. Okay, great. Fantastic. Thanks, Lisa. Take care. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 431. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Laura as much as I did. I always love it when I have an opportunity to talk to Laura. Her perspective on menstruation is so interesting. She just brings so much experience and obviously research as well into this topic and and really delves into it in a scholarly way. It kind of reminds me of when I was in university and I was taking all of these very interesting sociology and psychology classes. And I, I feel like it just, I always come from these conversations looking at things in a slightly different way and contemplating things at a deeper level. I think that as women, managing menstruation is a huge part of our lives. And whether you are cycling, you know, not on contraceptives and using something like fertility awareness to track your cycle or one of the apps that we were talking about, or whether you have chosen to use a a contraceptive option to suppress menstruation, you're still having to deal with it regardless. And this is something that the way I remember the first time I heard the concept of reproductive labor, all the things that we have to do because we're women, because we're able to reproduce and because we have a menstrual cycle that is essentially unpaid labor that's not valued by society. And even the most basic, as far as I'm concerned, concession that I think should be made for women all over the world is that I do believe that menstrual products should be free and available in public washrooms just like toilet paper. And I've been saying this for probably about 20 years, but it's because, you know, it just seems it's like a normal bodily function. Half the population experiences it. So why wouldn't we just have it in the bathroom? You know, why is it something that, I mean, it doesn't mean that the companies wouldn't still sell it and we wouldn't still take care of ourselves and manage, but I don't have to bring toilet paper around with me when I go to the bathroom. So why can't we do that? (laughs) So maybe that's the hill I'll die on. I've been saying that for so long. There are some places in the world who've looked into doing that. But it's always very interesting to consider menstruation, how it affects women's lives, and why there's so much taboo and stigma around it, and the general progress that we've been making towards making it just an easier process for women to deal with. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.